All right. So today we're going to talk about the integral like we promised and we'll have time to pause and all that stuff for questions. So last time we talked about a scenario where you were traveling in a certain direction, you know, we saw sort of this velocity versus time graph and you had some curve and I wanted to know, well, at the end of my trip where the blue line ends, how far did I actually go? And we decided that a good way to get about it was to do these rectangular approximations, right? We started to draw these pictures under the curve and we saw that this is a pretty good approximation to determine how far we actually travel. We also saw that as we decreased the step size, so if we make the rectangles thinner, then it's a better approximation of the actual value of the curve. So these are like the, this is like the overview, right? But the, this, these are gonna be the technical details that are gonna help us build up what the integral actually is. So again, why are we talking about this? Why are we, why don't I just give you the tools outright? Part of the reason is these tools are abstract, right? And in the real world, often we have to make measurements and then sort of estimate what the abstract thing should be, like uh, you know, how, what the total distance we traveled was given those measurements. So this is sort of like, if you see how it's built up, then you can sort of solve the same problems um, with only partial information, which is good. Okay, that's the recap. So before we uh, move into actually defining the integral, we're gonna define some notation. So the first thing we're gonna define is this very fancy looking sigma notation, which is actually very nice. Um, so on the left here, I have some symbol, and this weird thing here is called a sigma. It's the name of the Greek letter. And there are a couple things to keep track of in this notation. So the first thing is that it's x subscript i, and the subscript refers to this running index, okay? So x subscript i refers to this running index, uh, where i ranges from one to n. So that's how I'd read that, right? And all it means is just, I'm gonna take these values of i between one and n, and I'm gonna sum everything in there. So in other words, x1 plus x2 plus et cetera, all the way up to xn, okay? So why don't I just write this right-hand side? Well, I, I certainly could, but I, then I have to write these dot, dot, dots. Um, and also this left-hand side is a little more compact. So it's just a little easier to, to look at, okay? So by the same token, I could have, I might just not have like an xi here, I might have some function of the xi, right? And then that would just be the same exact thing, right? It would be g of x1 plus g of x2 plus et cetera, all the way up to g of xn, okay? So just some new notation, nothing uh, really mathematical going on just yet. All right, so before we move on, any questions about the notation? Does that make sense? If we're good, just give me like a all good or something in the chat. All right, Mikhail's good. It's always good. Yuling. Okay. Other folks are maybe still deliberating or. All right, Evan's good, awesome. So. If you have a question, just please just go ahead and interrupt me. It's not a problem at all. Or put your question in the chat, either way. All right, Alex is good too, great. All right, so why, why did we introduce this notation? Well, last time we were talking about left-hand and right-hand sums. And as we started to sort of expand things um, and, 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 and decrease our like delta T that we were using, the number of terms that we had to sum got larger and larger and larger. So it gets messy, right? So using this compact sigma notation, we can start to write all those sums that we had last time in a more reasonable way. So suppose again, we're in the familiar situation where we have a continuous function on some closed interval, and we're gonna divide up this interval into n segments. Okay, so what do I mean by that? Let's just visualize it. So I have my interval A to B, and if I wanna divide it up into four segments, I would cut it in half, and then I would cut it in half again. And then this 
would be one segment where n is four, right? But I'm just leaving n general so that I can divide it into 17 segments if I wanted, right? So uh, we can divvy it up however we want, okay? And if we do that, then in this example here, uh, our delta t is the length of our interval over the four ways we divided it. So in other words, delta t should be the length of our interval over the number of subdivisions that we make if our delta t is constant. Okay. So that's all we're saying here. Right? So you have an interval, cut it up into pieces. This approximation step that we're taking is going to be dependent on how many pieces we cut it up into. That's basically it. Okay, okay and I'll, I'll draw this for you in a moment, um, but let's take a look at the right-hand sum. Actually, I think it's probably better to draw it alongside it. So again, we have AB, and our right-hand sum says that we start on the right and then we look left. So in other words, we measure at the end of our time interval, and then we say, oh, we probably traveled at the same velocity before that. So if T1 is right here, and our function is like this, this is F, then F of T1 is this point, right? And F of T1 times delta T, that's this rectangle. Okay, so that's this right here. And we keep doing that, right? We keep making our measurements at each, so T1 plus another delta T would give me T2, and so on and so forth, T3, right, all the way up to Tn, which would actually be B in this case, okay? And we're just divvying up these things and approximating them with these rectangles yet again, just like last time. But you notice that here, we have this like dot, dot, dot notation. So we can write this in sigma notation to make it a little nicer. So we're gonna do that. So instead of these dot, dot, dots, we're gonna have just sigma notation here. And because our delta T is constant, I really can just factor this out, right? So it's really just F of T1 plus et cetera, F of Tn times delta T, right? And then condense this guy and it becomes this sum, okay? And of course we can do the same thing for the left-hand sum, okay? But instead of uh, T1 through Tn, now since we're looking from the left, we're going to uh, have T0 through Tn minus 1. So in a picture, what that means is if I had, you know, A, B, and I split it up into four pieces, then this is T0, this is T1, T2, and T3 is B. So T0 is always A and Tn is always B. And you'll notice that if I am doing my left-hand side approximation, right, where I say, here's my value of my function, and then I look right and say that it's constant over that, if I do my left-hand side approximation, then I'm never actually including the value F of T3, F of B in my sum, okay? So that's just uh, like a pedantic point, but that's why you see here, that this sum goes from one to n, and this sum down here goes from zero to n minus one, because here are the, the blue piece is stopping here and looking right, and the red piece is, oh, I'm sorry, the opposite. The blue piece is stopping here and looking left, and the red piece is stopping maybe up here and, and looking right. Okay. Any questions about that? Or if you're all good, just let me know in the chat. Also, I'm sorry if you guys, I don't know if you can hear that, but <laughs> out in the country right now, and people think it's very fun to just shoot guns in the middle of the day. Right. All right, Michaela, Yuling, Zoe, awesome. You guys are all good. Alex is all good. Evan's all good. All right, still missing feedback from I think Brett, but that's all right, as long as he's doing all right. All right, 
So now we're gonna keep building our intuition for the definite integral. So last time we talked about how smaller and smaller delta t steps give you the actual area under the curve, right? The approximation gets arbitrarily good. And we had our estimation formula for the error where we said uh, the difference of the endpoints, as long as our function is always increasing or decreasing on an interval, is uh, times delta t is equal to the difference in the approximations. Difference in left hand, right hand approximations. Okay, so in particular, what this tells us is that as this term goes to zero, our approximations agree and they're arbitrarily good. Right? So really we get the actual value. So the next slide is a little scary, but I'll walk you through it. It's conceptual, right? So as long as you understand the integral on a conceptual level, you don't ever have to be afraid of this definition. But here it is and all its uh, horror. So again, we have the same setup, right? Same setup, continuous F, closed interval AB, delta T is the, the interval subdivided up. So we cut up our interval into n pieces, n pieces. And so the length of delta T is B minus A over N, the length of the interval over the number of pieces, okay? So we're gonna write our integrals like this, okay, which maybe you've seen before. And what this is saying uh, and how I will read this as the integral from A to B of F of T with respect to T or DT, okay? So this thing out here is telling you what you're integrating with respect to. So uh, ideally, your function in here should have some T in it, and if it doesn't, then it's at constant with respect to, to T, right? Um, and then that's less interesting, right? It's like integrating over a flat line. We, we know how to find the area of rectangles, so it's not very interesting. Okay, so what is the actual definition of this creature? Well, the integral, which is, uh, again, going to be the area, is the limit of these sums as n goes to infinity. And notice I'm defining it in two equivalent ways, either the left-hand sum or the right-hand sum. And my definition doesn't care because what we said on the previous slide, we said that as my delta t gets very, very small, as I let the number of subdivisions I have go to infinity, as n goes to infinity, this thing goes to zero, which means that my approximations actually agree. So I can define it in either way, because I'm saying as n goes to infinity, these things would agree, which means that my integral can be defined on either sum. It doesn't matter, okay? So here the definition is a little tricky because the top part has an n in it, so that n is going to infinity, but also this delta t has an n in it, right? The delta t depends on n because it's b minus a over n. Okay. So our number of subdivisions goes to infinity, which means that we're getting tinier and tinier rectangles to approximate, okay? And that's how we're gonna define the interval, right? It, it matches with our intuition, right? But writing it out in math seems a little intimidating at first. How's this definition? Are we doing okay with that? It's not necessarily the easiest definition. So, you know, if you have a question, please do ask it. Okay, so he's all good. Kayla's okay, good. I'll say one more thing as you're typing um, or getting ready to ask a question is that we will develop more tools to work with integrals that are easier than the definition itself. But we crafted the definition in order for it to match our intuition as best as possible, right? Mm -hmm. Go ahead. Somebody have a question? All right, well, um, it sounded like somebody was having trouble with their mic there. So if, if you have a question, just go ahead and type it in the chat and I'll interrupt myself to, to answer it. So please don't be afraid to ask. Okay, um, 
moving on, we're going to introduce some vocabulary so we can talk about these things in a precise way. So we just introduced this new notation, right, which is the area under the curve of F, right? It's defined as this limit, but we can just think of it as the area under the curve of F. F itself in this notation is going to be called the integrand. Okay. And the sums which are defining our integral, so remember that we said that this is the case, we said that this is the limit of these sums, uh, i equals zero, f of xi delta t, we said that this is the limit of these sums, right? And we're gonna call these sums Riemann sums. Riemann sums. Um, and the reason is that uh, Riemann was one of the like the forefathers of calculus. Uh, what's kind of curious that you might be interested in and in knowing is that uh, there's a more general version of calculus out there which is absolutely not covered in this course, um, but is kind of interesting. Riemann's calculus only deals with continuous functions. And uh, you can break up functions into their continuous pieces and deal with them in Riemann's calculus. But there's a more general class of function, uh, which you absolutely don't need to know anything about, called a measurable function, uh, which is not continuous necessarily. And uh, there is a calculus that deals with all measurable functions. So there is actually a more powerful version of calculus out there. Um, but that's just for your own fun fact knowledge, not for uh, anything to do with this course. OK. Um, and then what are we going to call A and B? Those are going to be the bounds of integration, okay? Or limits of integration, I guess. So just the limits of integration are A to B, F is the integrand, and the sums that define the integral are called Riemann sums. Okay, so not too bad, just introducing some vocabulary. Um, and what's good about this is that the the math that we compute with this thing actually matches our intuition. So what we wanted to be true all along, that if we have some positive function, and A really is an interval, if A is less than B, then the area under F between A and B is in fact the integral. And that's the key takeaway of this lecture. Okay? If you don't remember anything else from this lecture, I would say that's the best thing. Okay. And I'll nuance it a little bit more. So here, up here we said if F is positive, then it's just the area under the curve between the points, great. If F is sometimes positive and sometimes negative, then we have to count things with sine, okay? So the sum of areas above the x-axis minus the sum of areas below. So let's draw an example of this. So I have A and B, and I have my function F, which is continuous on AB. And I have my positive area in blue. And I have my negative area in red. Okay. Then the integral is no longer giving us the total area under the curve because it's counting it with signs. So the integral is actually giving us blue minus red in terms of area, okay, so it counts it with sine. Okay. So in other words, the integral will always give us change of position when we're integrating a velocity function. Okay, so that's what we said last time. All right, um, let's see how we can estimate these things, right? Because maybe we want to know what the, like how far we traveled, like we asked last time, but again, we have to sort of do approximations until we build up other tools or if we have partial information, okay? So let's suppose we're trying to estimate uh, this integral. So the integral from zero to six of a line, so three X plus two. So again, I can sort of draw this for you. So plus two, and then it sort of looks like this. And the area we're interested in is from this blue point here to the point six, which is somewhere out here, right? So it's sort of this, trapezoidal thing. Okay, I'm going to erase that so we can take a look at the work, right? So if we're estimating from the left-hand side, and you will be asked to be able to do left-hand and right-hand estimates, 
If we're estimating from the left-hand side, then we pick the point uh, zero, which subdivides uh, when we have a step of two. So, uh, so let me back up for just a moment. If we have a step of two and our interval is length six, that means we have three subdivisions, right? So in other words, it sort of looks like this with the blue tick marks there. So our left-hand estimate would tell me that I need to look at this point first. So that point is of course zero, right? So plugging in zero, I get three times zero plus two times however long my step was. So you'll notice every time my step is constant, so I'm just multiplying by however long my step is each time. So that's fine. So that's not changing. So it's, I start with zero and then two past zero is two and two past two is four. And that's all my three subdivisions. I've done three things and I'm adding them together and that gives me 48, okay? On the other hand, if I'm doing a right-hand estimate, I have to look to the right part of the subdivision and assume that that works for the left. So instead of starting at zero for the right hand, I would start at two and then four and then six. So here I have two and then four and then six, each plugged into my original function, three X plus two. And if I do the sums, then I see that I have 84 for my right-hand side estimation and 48 for my left-hand side estimation. So this, that's a pretty big gap, which means the approximation is pretty bad. And that's due in part to the fact that this step is pretty unreasonable. You don't, like, I mean, it's gonna depend on the function, but in general, you know, having a subdivision of like three things is not very good. You wanna have as many subdivisions as you can. So if you have a thousand subdivisions, it's gonna be a lot, lot better, right? All right, any questions about that before we move on to general Freeman sums? All right, if you're all right, just let me know in the chat. Kale and Zoe are all good, Evan's good. Ewing and Alex are good, great. Thanks guys. Um, so yeah, you will be asked to be able to do these left-hand and right-hand estimates for certain integrals. So I did wanna just show you how, that, how that's done, okay? All right, the other thing you might see is a general Riemann sum. So before, before we look at this definition, before we talked about delta t, we said, all right, delta t is gonna be constant. It's gonna just depend on n and however long my interval is. Okay, so it's just subdivisions. But if I drew my interval like this, you know, maybe I have subdivisions that look like this. And depending on the function that I have, that might be smart or dumb, right? I don't know. But I could feasibly have partitioned up my interval in any way that I want. And that's what a general Riemann sum is. It means that instead of taking a constant step, I could take a long step here, and then a very short one, another very short one, and then I could take another medium step here, and I can basically do whatever I want. And what's cool is that if I, if I generalize my Riemann sum in this way, and I still let the size of my partitions tend to zero, then it's still gonna give me the Riemann integral. So it's still a worthy object of looking at, to, to look at, right? So let's break down the definition of the Riemann sum, the general Riemann sum. So again, we have some function f, it's on the closed interval a, b. And we have cut up our interval into n pieces, but now the n pieces don't have to be the same length. So I'm gonna call, uh, I'm gonna cut up my interval like this, starting at A, and then each of my tick marks are gonna be at T1, T2, et cetera, Tn minus one, all the way up to B, okay? And then I'm gonna say, I don't actually need uh, to have my function evaluated at the tick marks, I can just have it evaluated at some place between the tick marks, and that will be good enough. So we're gonna call that place between tick marks CI. So for example, between these two black tick marks down here, here's a C, right? And you'll notice that it's less than or equal to. So I could choose CI to be TI, for example, right? But I don't, I'm not requiring that. So now I have, uh, 
this new generalized thing and this step delta t sub i now depends on i right because it can vary so it's no longer this this constant thing okay why am i introducing this why do i care about this well in some sense it's better than our normal riemann sums it gives us more flexibility how to cut up our our intervals and in another sense um it can be good for uh uh, when you have partial information, right? So say you're taking your measurements and, you know, you take one at the first hour, but then you fall asleep in the car and you, you're taking a nap and you wake up like a half hour after you were supposed to take a measurement, you can still take that measurement and it's still worthy to you. That's what the general Riemann sum tells you. Or maybe you're getting really antsy in your car and you're like, ah, oh, I just I don't have anything to do. I'm just going to take the next measurement. You can take a measurement before you're supposed to and it doesn't matter it's it's all all the better for it so you can have these uh the, the last note that i have on here is that you might see this on the worksheet where you know you have um, a step changes right so you might have like you go from two to four to five hours in to seven hours into your car ride to eight hours into your car ride right but here you took a step of two here you took a step of one two right and it's it's changing but the idea is that this is still going to approximate our interval so long as all of these steps still go to zero right and we can still do an estimation given a table of data like this okay so that's all i wanted to talk about for today so if you have any questions um let me know in the chat real quick or if you're all good just let me know but we'll end the recording there